school and community school and community support for children and youth experiencing homelessness. Um, and again, I just wanna make sure that your microphones are muted. And at the end of this presentation, uh, if you have any questions, we'll make sure to reserve some time for a Q&A session with our presenter. And you can put any questions that you might have in the chat box for them. I can get this over here. So our presenter this morning is Yatisha Blythe, and she is a program specialist at the National Center for Homeless Education. Prior to joining NCHE, she worked 15 years in the school district, gaining experience as a school counselor in a Title I school, district administrator for homeless and foster care education, district crisis team leader, COC board member, and member of the North Carolina Homeless Education Program leadership team. I am going to go ahead and hand it over to our presenter this morning, Ms. Yatisha Blythe. Good morning, and thank you um, so much for that introduction. So I am delighted to be here um, with you guys today. And again, our session title is School and Community Support for Children and Youth Experiencing Homelessness. So I am going to be presenting the majority of the content for you guys today, but um, I am also joined by a wonderful um, guest presenter as well, or co-presenter, I guess I should say. And um, she is from um, the South Carolina Department of Education. So I'm gonna stop talking for a few moments and I'm gonna um, invite Burley to come up and say hello and introduce herself. Sorry about that. My no. name is Burley Wright. Um, I am the McKinney Vento State Coordinator for the South Carolina Department of Education, and I'm honored to be here today um, to co-present alongside Yatisha um, and her all of her expertise. So thank you. Thank you so much, Burley. And again, I'm glad you're here um, to co-present with me. So um, I am Yatisha Blythe. A lot of people do call me Tisha, and I am a program specialist with the National Center for Homeless Education. If you have any questions about NCHE or questions about um, the McKinney-Vento Act or anything, um, education of homeless, and homeless children and youth related, um, there's my email. So the National Center for Homeless Education, I just want to explain our role um, a little bit to you guys. So we actually operate the U.S. Department of Education's Technical Assistance and Information Center, um, excuse me, I'm getting tongue-tied today, Center. And we do have a comprehensive website um, that has a tremendous amount of resources that are available to you. So no matter if you're an educator, if you're a liaison, if you're a parent, if you're a youth, if you represent a community agency, there's lots of resources and information out there um, for everyone. We also have a toll-free helpline number and a helpline email inbox. So if you ever have questions about anything related to the education of homeless children and youth, feel free to contact us. Also on our website, we do have a listserv. You can click on the link um, featured on the slide to sign up for our listserv. And then we also have products that are available for free download as well as for purchase. If you are a social media person, um, we do have a presence on Twitter. And so there is our Twitter handle. So during our session today, we will discuss the basic requirements of the McKinney-Vento Homeless Education Assistance Act. We'll also spend a little bit of time looking at the impact of the pandemic um, on McKinney-Vento eligible students in South Carolina, as well as look at some strategies for collabor collaboration between schools and community agencies. And then um, towards the end of our time together, we'll talk about resources for students and families that are available in South Carolina. So before we dive into things, let's spend a few moments setting the context, okay? So um, there are certain subpopulations of youth that are at higher risk for homelessness. And so um, Chapin Hall did a Voices of Youth Count, and these were the results of um, their study, which tells us which youth are at risk or highest risk, I should say, for homelessness. And I'm gonna give you guys a few moments 
just to look at some of this data. Um, I will say to you that the most astounding number on here is that youth that do not have um, a high school diploma or GED who have less education than that are 346% times higher or at risk for experiencing homelessness. Okay, so now that we've seen that, let's look at what things look like across the nation. So this is some national data from NCHE, and this is showing us the homeless children and youth enrollment from school year 2004-05 to school year 1920. And as you can see, um, the graphic shows us the steadiness of the increase of homelessness. So we can see that gradually um, homelessness uh, or students experiencing homelessness has increased about 5% each school year during this time frame. We see the lowest around school year um, 2006 and seven, and that has to do with the impact of Hurricane Katrina. And then we also see around the 17, 18 school year, there was also some decline and just you know to think about things and events that happen around that time. Um, this is after we experienced a lot of the hurricanes in the U.S. when we had those category four and five hurricanes. So a lot of folks um, were displaced and, you know, may not have been available to be identified as a child or youth experience of homelessness. Okay, so now that we've talked about um, national numbers, let's look at what's going on in South Carolina. So as of the 2019-2020 um, school year, the classifications of children and youth who experience homelessness were predominantly highest in that doubled up group. Those are children and youth who have um, experienced homelessness and have had to be taken in, um, doubled up with another family, taken in by a family member, relative, friend, whomever. Um, and the data that we're seeing across the, the screen is pretty much consistent with what has happened um, nationally as well. Then we can see that the hotel and motel population in South Carolina is at 15.1, unsheltered population 18.5, and then those that are in shelters or transitional housing awaiting foster care is 7.1%. Um, the one thing that I will note for you is that um, nationally, the unsheltered number is a little bit no lower. It comes in about 4.1%. Um, um, so even though there is some variation here, this is still pretty much consistent with what is happening across the nation. Some additional information about um, homeless student subgroups in South Carolina. Um, here we've got from school year 17, 18 to 1920, just showing you um, some of the data teased out in terms of the children with disability subgroup, the unaccompanied youth subgroup, as well as the English learners. And so we can see that um, those numbers were pretty steady, but we do see some decline with the 1920 school year. And I'm pretty sure you guys are thinking, oh, the pandemic, and, and that's absolutely it. So we experienced those hurricanes and then we also experienced the pandemic. So that has caused um, a little bit of decline in some of the numbers with identifying homeless children and youth. All right, so now that we've set the context, let's look at what the federal law says. So we're gonna jump into an overview of the McKinney-Vento Homeless Education Assistance Act. So um, with homelessness, we know that homelessness does cause barriers or creates barriers for students. And a lot of times, some of these barriers are not always obvious. Um, a lot of times, children and youth experience homelessness can hide in plain sight. And so um, it, it can look like, you know, just regular things. Um, a lot of times, you know, children or youth may not want anyone to know. Parents may not want to know. They may fear what would happen if someone knows. So um, these are children and youth who, you know, are not just hungry, um, are not just tired or stressed out, but they also may be um, lacking transportation. They may um, move around a lot, change residences a lot, change schools a lot. And with having to move abruptly, um, they may have lost some documents that they need to, um, to have for school enrollment. So they may be missing birth certificates or social security cards or may not have um, up-to-date uh, medical records or health um, 
health um, screenings or immunizations. Um, also, they could be a youth who's out there, you know, experiencing homelessness on their own, meaning they don't have a parent or guardian who's with them um, to help them through the process. And so those are our unaccompanied homeless youth. And most often, um, children and youth experiencing homelessness are not connected to positive social ties, okay? So homelessness directly can um, affect education. So these students, you know, they may be lacking school supplies. They may not have a backpack. They may be lacking um, a quiet or safe space to study or to do homework. Some of them uh, may also have some undiagnosed special education needs, but um, oftentimes we've seen situations where students are actually um, dealing with trauma. They've experienced trauma. The um, Homelessness itself is a traumatic event, but there may be some other um, childhood experiences that have been traumatic. And a lot of times um, trauma can be misdiagnosed as a special education need. Um, a little while ago, we talked about that 346% um, youth group who has less than a high school education or a GED. Um, and so those students are, you know, probably those two who score poorly on assessments or tests or have lower grades and are chronically absent. And so that population, you know, they're at risk also for dropping out of school. And that's what we really, you know, would like to prevent. So what does the McKinney-Vento Act tells us? Well, the McKinney-Vento Act is here to help and support any child or any youth who's experiencing homelessness. Um, the McKinney-Vento Act is the federal law that establishes the definition of homeless that is used by public schools. And so this definition applies to all public schools, um, including charter schools, magnet schools, and public virtual schools. And the emphasis or the goal or focuses of McKinney-Vento is for that school identification, so for children and youth to be identified in school, to be immediately enrolled, um, to have some school stability, and then, of course, for them to be successful in school. So not only just, you know, making sure they have access to their free and appropriate education, but having those supports that they need academically, socio-emotionally, or being connected to wraparound services. Um, and so all of that is important, and it is um, the focus of the McKinney-Vento Act. Um, the protections under McKinney-Vento are for children who are in public pre-K through high school. A requirement of the McKinney-Vento Act is that every school district or every LEA appoints a local homeless education liaison, as well as every state is required to have a coordinator for homeless education. And so uh, my co-presenter, Burley Wright, she serves in that role um, for South Carolina. And um, and I will say that um, something that is helpful is that I do have that experience of being the local homeless education liaison. So again, if you do have questions after today, please feel free to reach out to either one of us. Another requirement is that SEAs and LEAs are required to remove barriers to the identification, enrollment, and retention of homeless children and youth. Um, if you ever feel like you need um, more knowledge or more education about the McKinney-Vento Act, um, this presentation will be shared with you guys after today. All the links are active. They do work. And so um, this link right here on the bottom of this slide will take you to the full text of the non-regulatory guidance. All right, so now let's look a little bit deeper at the definition of homeless under McKinney-Vento. So the law says that children and youth are considered to be homeless when they are lacking a fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence. Um, they don't have to be lacking all three. So if any of those one pieces is missing, whether it's fixed, whether it's regular, whether it's adequate, um, adequate, they could be eligible um, as a student who's experienced a homelessness. So children and youth who lack a fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence, including those who are sharing their housing or sharing housing due to loss of um, housing, economic hardship, or a similar reason. This is that doubled up classification of homeless children and youth that we talked about when we looked at the pie chart. These are also um, 
children and youth who, you know, have lost housing and are having to live in a hotel or a motel, a trailer park, a campground, um, an abandoned building, some public space that's, you know, not designed for living or for dwelling or for sleeping accommodations, those that are in um, emergency shelters or transitional shelters, including domestic violence shelters, um, those that have been abandoned in hospitals, as well as those who may be sleeping in a car or, um, again, a public space or an abandoned building, or their migratory children who are living in any of the above situations. And so please know these are the most common living arrangements that children and youth experience of homelessness may be in, but this is not an exhaustive, exhaustive list of living situations looking a little bit deeper at fixed, regular, and adequate. In the law, there is not um, a clearly defined definition for fixed, for regular, or adequate. So just looking at um, definitions from the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, fixed means that something is stationary or that is permanent and it's not going to change. Regular means it's predictable, it's consistent. Um, there's a routine established there. And then adequate means that it's sufficient for meeting physical and psychological needs um, within the home environment, as well as lawfully and reasonably sufficient. So a good way for liaisons to look at fixed, regular, and adequate when they're making McKinney-Vento determinations is for them to, you know, ask, can the student go to the same place every night to sleep in a safe and sufficient space? Um, McKinney-Vento identifications are case by case, but this is the guiding rule and this is what we encourage um, liaisons to use you know the legislative wording when they're making those determinations okay so liaisons are responsible for making the eligibility determinations and they're responsible for ensuring that these students are identified a lot of times that cannot just happen you know just on their own so a lot of time liaisons do have to collaborate and coordinate with school staff um, whether it be a school social worker or counselor, um, or they may even have to coordinate with a community agency, a shelter agency perhaps, or some other agency that may be serving children and youth. And then again, um, just know that eligibility determinations are on a case-by-case -case basis, and liaisons are encouraged to consider how their living arrangement uh, matches or compares with the legislative wording. Um, if you ever find yourself in a position to need to make an eligibility determination as a liaison, um, we also do have a brief and the link to that is at the bottom of your screen. So we talked about uh, the requirement for homeless children and youth to be enrolled in school, to be identified, be enrolled and be served and supported. But let's look at enrollment. Enrollment should be immediate, okay? And enroll and enrollment includes participating fully in school activities. So that means attending classes, and participating in school activities. So it doesn't mean um, we're gonna put you in the system, but we're gonna make you wait five days before you can go to class because we need to build you a schedule. Enrollment should be immediate. So enroll and enrollment is attending classes and participating fully. And that also means that if a student is lacking the necessary documents, um, school records, medical records, um, birth certificates, anything like that, they still need to be immediately enrolled in school. Um, if it is beyond an application period or um, an enrollment deadline and they missed it because they were experiencing homelessness, then they still should be immediately enrolled in school. And also if this is a student who has um, a history of chronic absenteeism or um, a student who has outstanding fines or fees, that cannot deny them from being um, immediately enrolled in school if they are experiencing homelessness. Okay, so another thing to know about McKinney-Vento eligibility is unaccompanied homeless youth. And we kind of talked about this um, a few minutes back about how these are um, youth who may be figuring out things on their own. This definition is one that gets um, people tripped up a little bit because it's a two-parter to this. So not only do these students who are considered unaccompanied homeless youth, not only are they um, in a living situation that qualifies, that meets the definition of homeless, 
service, but they are also on their own, meaning they are not in the physical custody of their parent or guardian. So to be considered an unaccompanied homeless youth, these two criteria have to be met. And we do have an unaccompanied youth eligibility flow chart that's very helpful if you find yourself in a situation looking at eligibility. Um, I will say that sometimes students um, could, can be considered unaccompanied, but they may not be an unaccompanied homeless youth. So there are some times where there's some planned living arrangements where a youth may be residing with a family member for an extended period of time, and um, they're serving as a caregiver. Um, those planned living arrangements um, are stable, they're fixed, they're regular, they're usually adequate. And so that would not be considered uh, a McKinney Vento unaccompanied homeless youth. So again, um, with this piece of it, just know that there's two criteria for someone to be considered an unaccompanied homeless youth. And because at NCHE, um, throughout our helpline, we do get a lot of questions about the eligibility of unaccompanied homeless youth. I did just want to point out some specific eligibility provisions for unaccompanied homeless youth. So there's not an age limit defined in the law. A lot of times people ask, how young can they be? How old can they be? Or what age can they no longer be considered an unaccompanied youth? And there is no age requirement. So what we um, encourage everyone to do is to look at their state age limit for public education. Um, also, youth um, can be eligible regardless of whether they left on their own or if they were asked to leave or if they run away. So um, they are still eligible, even if it was their choice to leave. A lot of times there's family dysfunction. There may be some abuse. Um, a lot of times um, children and youth who are figuring out um, their sexual identity, um, a lot of times that can cause dysfunction. So again, it does not matter if they have you know, ran away or left on their own, or if they've been put out, they are still eligible if they're lacking a fixed, regular, adequate nighttime residence and not in the physical custody of their parent or guardian. Also, um, just to know that sometimes parents and guardians can be permanently housed while the student is experiencing homelessness. Um, and there are often times in situations where Parents may also be experiencing homelessness, but there may be, um, they may be living in a shelter and there may be some requirements about, you know, the age of children or, you know, especially with male children. Sometimes some shelters say that if a, um, a male child is over the age of 12 or 14 or something that they can't be in a shelter with, you know, women and younger children. And so sometimes youth are left to figure things out on their own. They, they may leave or their parent may ask them um, to leave. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about school selection. Um, oftentimes with McKinney Bento, um, sometimes people consider this to be uh, a protection that means you can go to any school that you want to, and that's not the case. So under McKinney Vento, there are two school options. There's the local attendance zone school, meaning it's the public school that all students living in that attendance zone are eligible to attend, or it's their school of origin. And that school of origin is the last school that they were um, enrolled in when they were permanently a hat permanently housed. Um, the last school that they were enrolled in also has extended to public preschool programs, as well as those feeder pattern schools or those receiving schools at the next grade level. Um, typically, it is presumed to be that the school of origin is the school that's in the best interest of homeless children and youth. Um, you know, it does help with stability. Um, so under McKinney Vento, um, the school of origin is typically presumed to be um, what's in the student's best interest. And again, that's the school that they were last attending when they were permanently in house or the last school that they were enrolled in. So best interest, um, school districts, um, or I should say liaisons and school districts, as well as the parent and youth, those best interest determinations about school selection 
are done and are made with input from the parent or the unaccompanied youth. So those decisions about which school the student will attend, you know, are based upon student-centered factors and looking at what's in the best interest of the student. Um, students can continue in their school of origin the entire time that they are homeless. Um, some may be in brief, brief periods of homelessness. Some may be in chronic homeless situations. Um, also, if a student becomes permanently housed during the middle of a school year or towards the end of a school year, if they were McKinney Vento eligible at any point in that school year, then they have the right to be um, served as a McKinney Vento student until the end of the year in which they become permanently housed. Also, um, when students become homeless between school years, so like over those summer breaks, um, when school is out, at the beginning of that school year, if they are deemed to be um, experiencing homelessness, then they do have a right to attend that previous school or um, that school of origin. Okay, dispute resolution. So disputes are basically disagreements. Um, it's a disagreement about a student's eligibility for McKinney-Vento. It's a disagreement about which school they will attend or it's a um, disagreement about enrollment. And so anytime there is a disagreement or a dispute and enrollment is denied, then a written statement must be given to the parent or guardian or to the unaccompanied youth that explains the reason as well as what the steps for um, the appeal process look like. And so um, in this written document, it needs to be in a format and a language that the parent, guardian, or the unaccompanied homeless youth can understand. So it needs to be something very simple, again, stating the reason um, they were denied McKinney-Vento and what the steps to appeal look like. Um, parents and students um, must be immediately referred to the homeless liaison because they are required um, to handle dispute resolutions. Also during this time, whatever school um, has been requested for the child or youth to attend, then they uh, must be enrolled and receive services at that school while the dispute is being mediated. Okay. So a service that is provided to children and youth experiencing homelessness is transportation. And parents, um, an unaccompanied youth, um, or even the liaison can request um, that students experiencing experiencing homelessness receive transportation to their school of origin for the duration that they are homeless. And again, even if they become permanently housed, then they do have the right to be transported to that school of origin until the end of the school year. And school districts decide what the mode of transportation is. So a lot of times at NCHU, we do get asked, um, what's allowable, what's the allowable transportation? Well, it has to be transportation that is comparable to what other students can receive and also safe. So districts do have their own discretion to decide what that mode of transportation will be. Homeless children and youth are also eligible for free meals. So any school that participates in the U.S. Department of Education's um, free and reduced lunch program, those children um, can receive free meals. They are categorically eligible and parents don't necessarily have to fill out um, a lunch application. It can be done um, simply by the liaison providing the school nutrition director a list or it can be done by um, a shelter director. School success, um, this is a major focus as well of the McKinney-Vento Act. Um, and what's important for school success is, you know, making sure that homeless children and youth receive the services that they need. So they oftentimes may need to be referred to a CBO, a community-based agency. Um, oftentimes they may have some undiagnosed special education needs. So ensuring that um, children are, and youth are connected to the provision of services under IDEA for students with disabilities, and then any other academic supports that are available, any type of um, meals or food assistance or any other kind of district level supports, tutoring if it's available, school supplies, backpacks, whatever services the district has put in place. And an important thing to do is to use trauma-informed practices when interacting with students and parents. Again, um, many homeless children and youth have experienced 
a great deal of trauma and the event of homelessness itself is a traumatic event. So you just want to be sure that you're sensitive um, to their needs and also use that trauma informed language. Um, just briefly, I'll talk about the funding sources that are available to serve students. So um, the McKinney-Vento Act works hand in hand with Title I Part A. So districts that have Title I funding, there is a reservation for um, serving homeless children and youth under Title I, and that's usually called the Title I set aside. Um, most of the time that is um, the majority of funding that is available. There's also something called McKinney-Vento subgrants, which are federal grants that are available. Um, those are awarded by the state level. And so this is supplemental grant funding that um, can supplement anything that's being provided in under the Title I set aside. So there is a subgrant competition for those. And then also um, we know about ESSER, which is the elementary and secondary school emergency relief fund. So districts were able to receive um, those federal stimulus bills and receive that funding to support all students as well as students experiencing homelessness. And then there's the American Rescue Plan dollars um, that are available for homeless children and youth. And so a lot of districts do have that additional funding um, on top of Title I funding and maybe even a, a mckinney Vento subgrant to um, supplement and provide um, more services. Um, there's also state and local funds that may be available as well as donations donations or any kind of funding that comes from community partners and foundations. And um, one thing about the American Rescue Plan um, dollars, they, you know, that act does encourage there to be some coordination and collaboration with community-based agencies who can provide wraparound supports to children and youth um, experiencing homelessness. And in particular, you know, looking at those underserved student populations who um, definitely may need some additional supports. Okay. Um, to raise awareness around homeless education, it's important for LEAs um, to post the educational rights of students. So um, places that you can um, post these rights are shelters and um, other homeless service providers, you know, community-based agencies, uh, runaway homeless youth programs, um, those Department of Health and Human Services offices, food banks, um, public health departments or clinics, um, hotels where a lot of, you know, families may be staying that are experiencing homelessness, those ones that, you know, have weekly rates or even monthly rates that they provide um, folks, faith-based agencies, train stations, bus stations, preschool programs, laundromats, grocery stores, 24-hour stores, gas stations, sheets. <laughs> I said that because it's popular. Um, what's the other one? Loves. I think that's another popular one. Um, a public library, beauty schools, barber schools, just anywhere in the community where a lot of people frequent um, and getting that word out there and having those um, educational rights of children and youth who experience the homelessness published raises awareness so that folks know if they find themselves in a situation of homelessness, there is help and support. At NCHE, we do have some educational rights posters. We have them available in English or Spanish. And so um, these you can download and print your own or you can order directly from us and we can ship them to you, okay? So now I'm going to turn things over to my co-presenter and Burley's gonna talk to you guys about the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on homeless students in South Carolina. Thanks, Tisha. Well, um, I, I appreciate it. Well, um, as you can imagine, um, the challenges that, that our students experiencing homelessness here in South Carolina face, have faced and are facing still as a result of the pandemic are not unique to South Carolina. Um, so kind of what, have, what are we seeing, these trends we're seeing um, in South Carolina and around, um, around the United States. Um, learning loss, um, mental health challenges, um, a definite drop in identification. I know um, Tisha showed that um, first slide that showed that, that drop in identification and um, for um, children and youth experiencing homelessness. And that is one of uh, the big um, pushes that we're trying to do with the state office um, and supporting the, the local liaisons in terms of increasing identification. Because if you, um, 
once we were properly identifying, um, then we can um, provide those services that um, are required and um, under the McKinney Vento Act. Um, so more to come, and one of the responses, as um, and uh, Tisha already kind of alluded to this, to the um, pandemic was, of course, the American Rescue Plan, and I um, act specifically for homeless children and youth, and um, that is a valuable, um, and we're going to valuable resource that we'll um, dig into um, later on in the presentation um, to help support these um, this, our students experiencing homelessness as a result of the pandemic. All right, thank you, Burley, so much. Yeah. And so she'll be back with us um, in a few moments to look at or to talk to you guys about some resources that are available and also share with you a little bit more about the American Rescue Plan for homeless children and youth in South Carolina. So now let's talk briefly about some collaboration um, strategies for schools and community agencies. And I thought this was a good way to get us to think about partnerships. So partnerships should be intentional. And this slide says that education holds promise for students experiencing homelessness to secure living wage employment and make sustainable exits from homelessness. But intentional partnerships between McKinney-Vento staff and other programs will help capitalize on the promise of education. And so I know that, you know, we've all heard, you know, education is key. It is the way, it, it's the way um, for people to, you know, exit poverty and to exit um, generational poverty and to exit homelessness. Um, but we have to have those partnerships in place to make sure um, that whole child approach of um, providing services to homeless children and youth is in place. And so we'll talk about what um, collaborations look like. So let's look at in the school district. So school districts, um, there are certain departments or divisions within school systems that need to work together to um, reestablish or um, establish or create, you know, if there are not any procedures for homeless children and youth to receive the services that they need. So we've talked about Title I, which is um, a funding source. We've talked about Title Three. There's also um, special education, migrant education, the um, student services department, which is usually your school counselors, your school social workers, maybe even your school mental health coordinators, if there are some, um, also school nurses, transportation, as well as those preschool and after school programs, um, truancy and attendance offices or officers, um, SROs, if you have school resource officers, there's nurses, our food services and nutrition departments, and then our family or parent engagement or parent involvement staff. So at school districts, all of these departments need to be talking to each other. Um, it may not be every month, maybe quarterly, um, just depends on the unique makeup of the school district, but all of these departments do need to work together to come up with short-term and long-term long-term goals to support the needs of homeless children and youth. The good thing about um, community collaborations is it's okay if you don't have existing partnerships, all you have to do is reach out. Connect with whoever your, your cross-program counterpart is. So if you're working in the education side, connect with, you know, your community partnerships. It may be a faith-based agency. It may be United Way. It may be, you know, some local um, agency that's working to serve and support children and youth and families. Um, if you're ever in doubt, you can contact your state education homeless coordinator from the NCHE website. And this link will take you directly to our um, map of the U.S. You will just hover over your state and click on it and the information for the state coordinator um, is available. Those of you that live in South Carolina, you're lucky you have your state coordinator um, on the, um, in the session with us today. 
Um, all you have to do really to establish those collaborations, you know, is just start somewhere and build, you know, start with whatever the low hanging fruit is, you know, what are some things that, you know, you want to re achieve and can be achieved with, you know, limited effort, you know, and then over time you can work and build towards those long term goals. So you can start with something small and then work your way up to build into the more complex issues and then continue to invest, you know, continue to have that ongoing um, collaboration and communication and um, just increase, you know, the effectiveness of the efforts that you guys are doing within that partnership. The good thing about community um, collaborations is it's a good way to establish um, procedures for information sharing, um, a good way to establish like MOUs, memorandums of understanding or some joint intake forms, um, something that was extremely helpful to me as a liaison. Um, day one on the job, I got to know all of our shelter directors and it was me going out, hey, hello, how are you? I am, you know, Yatisha, I'm the homeless liaison for, you know, XYZ school district. And this is our form. This is what we use. This is my email. This is my phone number, you know. So just those community partnerships are uh, very valuable and very important. And another um, collaboration that's good is for liaisons. If you're living in a community where there's a local COC, the Continuum of Care, that collaborative of agencies for um, ending homelessness, it's a good idea to be connected connected with them. So there's lots of ways to um, do collaborations and to, to um, foster those partnerships. Again, it's just getting started and having that initial conversation and seeing what you both can do to work well together to meet the needs of homeless children and youth, whether it's in school or out of school. Um, we have more information on collaboration on our NCHEP topic page for collaboration. And so uh, we probably have uh, maybe about five or 10 minutes left of our time. I'm gonna turn it over to Burley because I want her to share with you guys resources that are available for students and families in South Carolina. Thanks, Yatisha. Yes, and this is just a drop in the bucket for resources. I know that um, I see some of our I see some liaisons on the on the call here. So just a quick shout out. Um, my um, number one, your number one resource is to connect with your the McKinney Vento liaison in your school district. And there's a um, a link here that will um, tell you who your liaison is um, in your school district. If you don't already know them, you want to collaborate. You want to reach out. You want to get to know them. No matter what. Um, Part of the school you um, district you may work in, um, you want to get to know them because you can make referrals to them. They um, may be making referrals to you. It's a great way to provide, you know, um, whole child wraparound services to our um, students and youth experiencing homelessness. Also, um, our um, continuum of care with our South Carolina Interagency Council on Homelessness, um, they are available. Um, they serve more than just families who are experiencing homelessness. They serve um, again, across the, you know, individuals experiencing homelessness, families that serve homelessness, but in each region of our state is a continuum care of care, and they provide services, outreach, um, awareness, um, extensive resources um, for um, their, their specific community. So again, um, that link is live, and I know you'll have access to this PowerPoint. Um, SE Housing is another great resource. I encourage you, if you have families who are looking for housing, um, need support services, to reach out to them. They've got, um, again, there's a lot of different funding available um, as a result of the pandemic. So I encourage you um, and, um, to reach out to them to see what their programs are and to see if your families may um, may be eligible to apply. Um, this is a new um, resource that I um, have a connection and a collaboration that I've made over the last several months. Um, through the Child Care Resource and Referral Network at the University of South Carolina, there is a homeless liaison who pro helps provide, they don't provide the child care vouchers, but she, Amy Dubay, um, works specifically with families to help them um, acquire the, um, a child care, care voucher specifically for um, children who are experiencing homelessness. So that is key. And she is, you know, she's a great um, referral. She can do a warm handoff and she will walk the, the families through this process. Um, and so I encourage you to reach out to, to her as well. Um, and again, when you're um, 
asking, talking to your liaison and getting connected, ask your district, what is their American Rescue Plan? What, what are the, what's the, what's the plan? Um, where are the services going? Um, how can you get involved? How can you help? How can you collaborate? Um, because this um, American Rescue Plan um, too, it was, it was a um, formula for um, part two for the American Rescue Plan. So every district in the state of South Carolina is eligible to receive um, a specific amount of funding for um, specifically for children and youth experiencing homelessness. And the way the formula was created, it was based on 50% of your Title I allocation for the district, as well as um, your number of identified McKinney-Vento students for either the 1920 or the 2021 school year, whichever one was the highest. Um, that's how the formula was made. If you have any questions about that specifically, um, talk to your liaison if, um, and, I'll, and or please reach out to me. Um, to see what other resources um, and information I can provide. I'm, I love, I'm all about collaborating and look forward to um, continuing this work. And again, lots of other resources, but we don't have enough time. So I'll pass it back over to you. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that. And yes, the American uh, Rescue Plan funding, it's an unprecedented amount of funding for the first time ever. You know, of course, we never knew we'd experienced the pandemic, but, you know, thankfully our government was able to allocate, you know, $800 million to specifically serve children and youth who are experiencing homelessness. Great. And I will add, um, if that's okay. So South Carolina has received um, about $13 million. Um, over the, for a variety for, you know, and most of that is going, you know, some for state level activities, but most of it is all um, going into the, to the local um, districts. That's amazing. That's amazing. And I look forward to hearing about some of the great work that they're doing. Yes. All right. So now we are at um, a stopping point for questions. I have not seen anything um, in the chat in terms of a question. And I did um, see the comment earlier um, about how helpful it was to know the difference between the school of origin and the local schools. I'm glad that information was helpful. Um, let's see. Are there any additional questions? I think we have about four minutes left. Yes, we have about four minutes left. Again, if anyone has any questions, you're welcome to place those in the chat box for our presenters. And while we're allowing time for um, folks to do that, I just wanted to put um, both of our contact information up again. So again, um, yeah, Tisha or Tisha, and this is my email, my phone number, and then that's our NCHE helpline information at the bottom, the um, email inbox as well as our toll-free number. And then also for those of you that would like to have a conversation with your state coordinator, here is Burley's contact information. Okay, so we've got about three minutes left, and I did just want to take this opportunity to thank you guys um, for being here with us today. We hope that it was helpful and gave you um, not only just um, an overview of the McKinney-Vento Act and what the rights are of students experiencing homelessness, but kind of just gave you that context of, you know, what homelessness looks like um, across the nation as well as in South Carolina, and then um, also giving you guys some tools to help you with collaboration and letting you know what funding is available to support students. Thank you. Lots of great feedback. We truly appreciate that. Okay, so we're down to two minutes. Well, no questions. Thanks, I everybody. hope that means. I hope that means that we touched everything that folks need to know about Burley. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right yeah thank you everybody for joining us today